So in terms of, of the Christian Gospels mm -hmm. or the Catholic Gospels, would you see those as, as, as human stories or as, as truth? I think they're uh, inspired writing. So, you know, some parts of them are history, some parts of them are, uh, what's the word, there's a technical word, anagogical, I always mispronounce the word, anagogical, uh, where it's teaching something farther ahead, you know, by giving us a small picture of it now, um, and some parts are poetry. And when you were an atheist, mm -hmm. before you, be you believed in it, would, would you have accepted the, the, I mean, what most atheists mm -hmm. would believe, looking at that story's Without, through the, without going through the filter of believing in, in a God mm -hmm. or believing that's divinely inspired, particularly if you read the books mm -hmm. in the chronological order in which mm -hmm. they were written rather than the... the, the I mean, I did not spend an enormous in, in, in time, period. except for school assignments, reading the mm -hmm. Bible at all. Okay. Um, you know, I knew parts of the mythology, you know, just in the way that everyone absorbs it from culture. I learned part of the Bible from reading Philip Pullman, right, because I had right. to, to uh, understand the His Dark Materials series better. Um, so I'm in no way an expert in uh, biblical literature. There are some people who end up converting because they're convinced through the Bible just by that work alone, yeah. and I'm not one of them. So for me, I don't know of a reason why an atheist would look only at the Bible and say, yes, word of God. I think you'd come in with a different belief that would cause you to believe that, but I know there are people who have come in not expecting it to be the word of God and through the word itself being converted. I just haven't spoken to them and don't know why. Yeah, if you take mm -hmm. what, what, where I was going with that is that mm -hmm. if if you do read a chronologic, mm -hmm. what you find is, is is that the earliest books um, mm -hmm. are talking about a, a um, essentially a human Jewish preacher who is trying to get Jews to become or stay good Jews, um, and his initial message in the chronologically first written books, mm -hmm. which would have been the letters of Paul, the, and up as far as the the the, the gospel called Mark, um, probably the early books of, or the early parts of the book of Revelation, that the message there was a, a very explicit uh, um, message that the world was coming to an end and the kingdom of God was coming within the lifetime of those that were listening to him and therefore you should uh, adhere to the, the Jewish scripture mm -hmm. because that is what would save you when the, the kingdom of God came. And that, that over a period of time as that generation did die out, it was then that chronologically you started getting, uh, in, in Matthew and Luke, you started getting uh, new stories added on that weren't in Mark, that had a slightly different message and that were taking things from the, the old Jewish scriptures and, and, and generating what were asserted to be uh, prophecies. And then by the time you reach John, the thing has become completely metaphysical and God has been there from the, the beginning. To be honest, I think to have a really productive conversation about that hypothesis, you'd need a different interview guest because I've not made a major study of the history of the Bible. Um, so I could bring up some of the counter arguments I've heard, but I'm going to be parroting people I haven't studied deeply. So I'm just totally the wrong person to interview okay. you. But so, that. so that's not then, that, but that's not part of... of um, no, I worked, when we want to talk about working chronologically, I worked yeah. backwards from like lots of commenters in the present discussing just how to live or like arguing with each okay. other mostly about that and then looking at who they were reading and reading them and looking back and looking back. I got to the Bible last, right? Okay. I was working my way through current people arguing like back through like Lewis and Chesterton and then like to the church fathers and like ended at the Bible. So there are lots of people who can talk a lot about the historicity claims and you know how do we know who introduced what when and the genealogy of ideas yeah. and I'm just completely unqualified to have yeah. a... No, I'm, I'm not talking about it. the historicity claims, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about is, is, is just the, the evolution of the theology of yes, the Yes, but honestly, reading. like, this is like a discussion of, like, Shakespeare's women, how did they develop over the, like, chronology of his plays, where I've read a number of Shakespearean plays, and I don't have a strong, like, ability to defend a thesis on it. I could, I mean, I could, like, talk in depth about, like, one play I particularly enjoy, but I'm not a scholar, and I think if I gave any long explanation, parts of it would be wrong, it would wind up being misleading. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at this, because, um... Because of the curiosity mm -hmm. and intellectual rigor that you did display mm -hmm. in your during your atheist mm -hmm. period, um, why you wouldn't be equally curious about things like that? So I am curious, but one thing is just you know you can I'm curious about a lot of things, and I have limited time. Yeah. So you know there are parts of theology I like spending a lot of time in. Um, yeah. What what would they be? Oh, well, you know, uh, I think a lot of time reading more about Orthodox theology, uh, about the Christus Victor, um, Jesuit spirituality, um, and, you know, a lot of the 
genealogy of ideas, things in the Bible, when I've read some of the books that people have written on both sides, yeah. and most of what I've walked away with is I would really need to go to grad school to be able to sort this out well. And since I don't want like to go to grad school, um, I just don't think it's a good use of my time because for me, I'd only get up to being a dilettante in it. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't feel that productive. There was this... But, but if you do believe... Lee, yeah, let me actually have an exact parallel sure, yeah, of this. Uh, there was this really fun article in The New Yorker a couple of years ago about these um, possible Galileo forgeries. And yeah. the article was fascinating, but, you know, in the, you know, different truth claims being made by the alleged forger and the alleged discoverer, both of whom seemed very shaky at various times, all I could do was read the reporter because I would need to actually learn how to analyze paper to analyze the claims yeah. made in the article. And there are some, you know... Topics in which I am in depth enough to do that, and this really isn't one of them. But but if you do believe, Leah, that, mm -hmm. that morality is a mm -hmm. person, that person is God, mm -hmm. and, and that the Catholic Church is mm -hmm. the way that that God has revealed Himself to you, mm -hmm. um, what what more productive use of your time could there be than than studying the book that He has inspired? Well, there are different ways to study it. One is studying it, you know, with an eye to how it's impacting my day to day life, and one is studying the history of it. And I'm doing okay. more of the former than the latter. Okay, and, and mm -hmm. what, what things have you found that uh, useful in that context? Sure, so let me think for a second. Um, I want to think of a good example, so... I mean, one thing that just happens is that, in the same way that when you read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, and you kind of go, oh, well, why are people behaving so stupidly, you know? Yeah. Uh, where he's telling all these stories about people who are kind of refusing to accept forgiveness and refusing to go to heaven. And you hit the one who's like, has your particular vice. Um, and you're like, oh, wait, that actually sounds like a hard choice now. So not only are you kind of face-to-face -face with your own hardness of heart, but you have a bit more charity for everyone else yeah. who's down the line. Uh, sometimes it's things like that. Um, so, you know, reading through parts of the Gospels or anything and seeing what's hard for people when Christ comes calling and, you know, feeling stroppy with various people and then going like, oh, wait, that one, that one sounds hard. You know, that's a thing I've not done. Uh, you know, one thing that's just difficult is just the idea of... Um, how far you should take radical poverty, you know, mm -hmm. or the man who's told to leave everything and follow. Um, and it feels like a much clearer, you almost go like, yeah. oh no, it's a much clearer choice when they mean literally follow me, I'm a person and I'm walking in this direction, yeah. so start walking, you know. Well, you see, in, in terms of the historicity, mm -hmm. and this is where it is useful. Uh, I'm not going to be qualified to Yeah, no, 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 but I'm, out, just saying, but I'm not asking <laughs> to tease out, I'm just saying as, as an example, in terms mm -hmm. of the historicity, to, to leave everything and follow mm -hmm. me from in, in, in a Christian context mm -hmm. comes from the parts of the Bible where Jesus was in the apocalyptic mode and was saying that the world is coming to an end within the lifetime of those listening, and that's why it was relevant to say you don't need your family, you, have, you know, you have to love me more than your family. You, you you don't need your property. That was the context in which in which that came, and, and as that generation died out, that's when the, the theology changed because it, it does change over time. So it, it, even in the context of the useful things that you're talking about, well, there's it's, also it's, uh, uh, you know just in the present day when you know, you don't necessarily expect to die before you're due to, yeah. you know, that kind of idea. There's something about the uh, apocalyptic strain of thought that's not wrong regardless of whether or not you're about to die. It's just that the way that it clarifies thought, um, you know, it's, it's, it, here's someone who's not an apocalyptic preacher at all, who gives the same idea in a similar way, uh, whose name I've forgotten, so it's a man quoted by Paul Graham, though not okay. Paul Graham himself, who worked at IBM and used to walk around asking, but what's the most important issue in your field? Um, and then people would tell them, and they'd know the answer, and they'd go, are you working on it? And they'd say no, and they'd go, well, why not? And there's almost the same question. And he's not saying, well, why aren't you working on it? I might shoot you tomorrow. You know, it just, once you think about what's the most important thing for me to do, you want to do it regardless of whether you have a hundred days or one day or a thousand years. So if I think, you know, well, leave everything and follow me, like, what should I be leaving? What am I currently doing that's, like, not right? Sometimes, you know, and, and, you know for me, I'm like, I have so much spiritual growth that sometimes my spiritual growth is very boring, right? But like, sometimes it's like, well, you know, like, if I were going to do the most important thing right now, what would I do? And I'm like, oh, I should really, like, phone my brother. I haven't in three days, and I love him, and I just, like, yeah. keep thinking about everything else but that. Um, I should do that right now, or rather, like, right when I finish this. Um, and, like, that's very boring, so I don't mean that it's, like, all exciting yeah. fireworks, but it's just, you know, thinking about what it means to follow Christ. It really means doing the most loving or important thing every moment, choosing that thing. Um, and thinking that your range of choices is broader than you normally think it is, which is part of the idea of radical poverty. You go, well, I give all I can give, and I go, well, like, what if it were actually important to give? What would you give then? And usually you give a different answer to that question, like, 
oh, I could actually do without this, or, you know, I could sell this, or I could live somewhere else. Um, so, you know, that's part of where that question goes. And, you know, part of it, the thing about the apocalyptic strain is that, you know, regardless of whether you're dying tomorrow or in many years, it's not like you want, oh, you know, what proportion of dud days do I want, you know? It's a strange way to live. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's the way that, that it, it's the... It, it's not just dying. Mm -hmm. In the context of the Bible, mm -hmm. it, it, well, it wasn't just dying, it was about the afterlife, it was about mm -hmm. what was going to happen after you died. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was, uh, the, the urgency of the message was, do this now or, or else, there, there or else you ways. won't be among the saved. Yes, but there are also two ways to talk about the urgency of the afterlife. One is, you know, well, I'd like to get to heaven because heaven's like a carnival park and it's all very exciting and it's well lit and you know, there are harps or, you know, whatever that one yeah. is, where it's like framed mostly as a reward. Um, there's also that, you know, you want to go to heaven because you want to be the kind of person you'd need to be to go to heaven, which isn't the same thing as I'd like to treat my mother well because I want a prize for it later. Yeah. I want to treat my mother well and I also want to go to heaven because the kind of people who go to heaven are the people who always treat their mother well, yeah. like as a So, so what, why, why do you need to add heaven into that equation? Well, part of it is that, you know, and, you know, they're different theological takes. Part of it is just that it is the continuation of the soul after death, and the natural state of a human soul is to, like, be one with God, and that's what heaven is, you know, to be wholly unseparated from God. And if you say that, um, you know, people talk about sin is what distances you from God. Sin is what also makes you less yourself. Um, um, and so, you know, if I'm tetchy or I'm bored yeah. or impatient, and I'm rude to someone, or, you know, dump work on someone else so that I don't have to do it, I'm uncharitable, I'm selfish, I'm farther from heaven because I'm farther from God, and I'm farther from who I should be, I'm a less ver lesser version of myself, I'm, you know, going back all the way to Platonism there, like, I'm less tably than a table should be. Uh, and so if you talk about it a bit in that context also, then going to heaven isn't a prize, it's just being yourself as fully and as best as you can be, um, which is difficult to do, you know, in the living world and doesn't happen fully till after death and doesn't happen fully by our own efforts. And do you think people who aren't Catholics go to heaven? Um, I don't know that they don't. Like, so there's, and again, I'm not a theologian, so I feel yeah. like, this but is what's just, your, just your... yeah, so like my strain on this is that uh, there's a phrase that I've heard that I think is a good phrase, which is that we know where the church is and we don't know where it isn't. Um, so what we say is, wow, it's really hard to be a decent person. Like, it's quite hard and I like, I don't know, like some of the way I talk about it, it's like I punch three people in the face per day, not that I literally punch them, but I do like yeah. that level of harm to people either actively or just being careless per day. Yeah. So it's hard. And, you know, what a lot of what Catholicism does when they say it's a hospital for sinners, not, you know, a palace for saints, is it's going, well, what's the thing you can do that's going to best help people to not be so terrible every day? And for that, it's the sacraments. It's the one place where we know God gives himself to us. Now, that's the place where we know, and that's the comfort of it. It doesn't at all limit other ways God can reach people. Um, it wasn't would a, would you like to be a priest? Um, I don't have any calling to it. Um, and I'm, again, not conversant. This is the thing. So, you know, I've heard people... The most interesting thing I've heard is that people who feel a genuine calling who are women, I think that's interesting, and people who know more about theology than me should discuss it. Um, but, you know, there are also men who feel a genuine calling who also don't become priests for other reasons. Um, and most do, do you think women should be allowed to be priests? I don't think it's a question of allowed. Um, you know, it's not as though the Catholic Church doesn't kind of make up rules for them. Like it looks like it makes up rules, but what it really is trying to do is, like mathematicians, derive accurate rules from the theorems it has. Okay. Do, do you think is, the Catholic Church should derive a different rule? from the terms that it has with regard to women. So again, priests. since I haven't studied the theology of the priesthood, I don't have a stronger opinion on that than I do on whether the Riemann hypothesis is true or false. Like, which is again, and I've spent more time, honestly, reading about the Riemann hypothesis yeah. than I have about the theology of the priesthood. Um, so but why, for, for somebody who, um, in your atheist period, was, as I say, so okay, I, yeah. intellectually well, you know, figuring out your own yeah. take on things, why? Why is your your answer? Well, I don't know what they're going to think because I haven't studied. I have so haven't studied what they I mean, have studied. So two things. One is that I've been Catholic. Well, I don't. For, I don't know what to think until they yeah, tell yeah. me. So one is that I've been Catholic for about three years. So yeah. like, there really are only a limited number of things I could study in that period. And yeah. I pick most of the ones that make the most difference in my day to day life. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I maybe selfishly, maybe virtuously, I'm not even sure. I pick the ones that like most make me a better person towards other people. Uh, as much what as what are they? 
Uh, you know, a lot of thinking about what charity is, how to express it, looking to better models or weirder models so that it's not you just go, oh, I couldn't possibly do a kind thing or that person, I can't think of anything. And then you read the lives of the saints and go, well, some of those are crazy. Catherine of Siena frightens me. Like, she's so good that, you know, it's very frightening. Uh, but, like, maybe I can do a very small version of what she does. Uh, so I've spent more time into that. Um, when I'm older, when I'm, you know, 50 or 60, I'll probably have studied theology of more things, but I haven't now. I'm about to be 25 and it would be really, I think, presumptuous of me to claim like grad school level knowledge in a lot of fields yeah. that I don't have it in. I wish I'd had time to like study the Riemann hypothesis and have like knowledge of that because it'd be so awesome. Um, but I pick the things that are either most urgent to study and also most pleasurable and I've had a very short time so I don't feel really bad that I haven't learned all the things immediately. Do, do you feel under pressure if you, if, well, I'll preface mm -hmm. this by asking first of all, mm -hmm. Do you think that it's possible that you might be mistaken? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you feel under more pressure because of the fact that you are publicly known as a prominent atheist convert to Catholicism? Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel under more pressure to maintain the Catholic position because of that? So I'd say marginally more certainly in the same way that when I was an atheist blogger who had my name all over the internet, I had marginally more pressure to remain an atheist. Um, you know. And, you know, I thought about, one thing I thought about when I was doing it was, you know, I have the option, when I was changing my mind, instead of becoming a Catholic blogger, I could just stop being an atheist blogger. You know, there's no yeah, law that says yeah. I have to share all my opinions on the just internet every day. Mass. I mean, I'm so tempted to do that. <laughs> every morning I'm like, oh, you know, can I, can I go with writing more posts about math today? And often I do. Uh, but, no, so, I mean, there's pressure in both directions. There was pressure in the other direction, which is one reason I waited. So I can tell you, certainly, if I ever deconverted, like, you'd hear about it, like, four months afterwards, actually, after thought. I don't want to do my whole thinking process in public. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some pressure, but, like, not so an unduly coercive So if, you, so if you have already converted, yeah. like, we, we, we don't know yet. <laughs> I solemnly swear I haven't. <laughs> but, you know, you can set a timer and double check. Okay. Um, but, you know, like, I don't expect to. I didn't expect to then. Most people don't expect to change whatever beliefs, like are important to them. Um, and the thing I always want is to like know and love the truth, which luckily is something, you know, the Catholic God is very fond of, like, the truth wants to be known. And something like, I think that's actually a virtue that atheists and Catholics share, you know, and don't spend as much time kind of being excited about in that, you know, Catholics worship a God, you know, a revelatory God who wants to be known, who made rational beings who, unlike rocks, right, can know him. That's a very exciting part. Um, I know a lot of the atheists I know are people who have this intense desire to know the truth. Um, and then we all disagree very strongly on what it should be, but, you know, there's something that's just very lovely about being engaged in that quest. And, you know, and this is what I liked about my college debate group, and that it was all people who felt that way. And so you'd really just have kind of moments where you'd pause in the middle of an argument and go, wow, it's so great that, like, we're putting time into this question, um, and that's three in the morning, but we don't care, and that you want to keep having it with me. Also, yeah, I can't believe how wrong you are, and all your ideas have terror, and then you go, like, straight back in, right? But, like, in the same way that you get, get struck by wonder in math class, there's something just very beautiful about coming towards truth. Did, did you ever think, I mean, you, you, you compared um, some of your... Uh, thoughts about mm -hmm. about God and or about morality rather than about God because before you reached God mm -hmm. with, with with mathematics, mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about uh, in 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 the post either either the post that mm -hmm. you talked about your conversion mm -hmm. or or a post that, that was linked to from that, you were talking about comparing it to the 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 idea of you comparing morality to the idea of um, you know tunus mm -hmm. in in mathematical terms mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I, I just want to tease that out for for a second. First of all, with the maths, and then go back to the the morality. Uh, do you, do you think that the concept that exists independently of, of people is tunus, mm -hmm. or do you think that it's just I'm making up terms here because I don't study maths, <laughs> or is it just quantitiness, mm -hmm. and and that and that it is us that applies the the specifics of tunus to the more abstract quanti quantitiness, um, and if that is the, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll taste that out first and then I'll go on the follow on. So I think either, either claim, um, like I said, I don't want to jump too much into, I don't want to overinterpret what you just said, but I think if you were saying that there's quantityness or twoness, you're making kind of platonic assertions. As I'd say, like for the slightly more, easier for me to explain, like Pythagorean theorem exists before Pythagoras, he names it, he doesn't make it, and 
as long as there are triangles, so too shall there be this property of triangles. You know, they cannot be divorced, they exist outside of us. We are privileged to get to see them, and, you know, again, like, that's the interesting thing, right? Like, we're privileged to get to see them, but Pythagoras' triangle doesn't derive anything from us seeing it, we just derive kind of the sense of beauty and wonder, and then a greater ability to understand the world and work within it. Yeah. Because now you can design better things. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of the other thing, though, the, the, the nuance that I was trying to tease out, which I'm not yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I may have missed it. Go no, ahead. Is that? Let's see. What's a better way of, of looking mm -hmm. at it? Um, let's say you are a being of either uh, huge or tiny scale, okay. so that where there are what we would look at as a certain number of objects and say there are five of those. Mm -hmm. um, if we were of a, a far larger scale, it would just look like there is, if we were far mm -hmm. larger, it would look like that's just one thing mm -hmm. rather than five separate okay. things. Or if we were tiny mm -hmm. and we could see them see them in more nuance than, than, than we can, mm -hmm. it might not look like five things, it might look like three of one thing and two of mm -hmm. another thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so, so while the concept of a quantity could be described as, as mm -hmm. objectively existing, the concept of measuring that quantity is purely subjective. In the, oh, okay, in the, okay. I see where I see much the, better where you're going right now. Subjectivity of, of the whatever it is mm -hmm. that's looking at them. So one thing to say um, is that you know the thing itself exists and is seen at different scales, um, and none of yep. the fact that people are not seeing it accurately means it's not actually the shape and quantity that it yeah, is. Yeah, not denying. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, we're we're, we're just getting so that's the, the part that's, that's the part that's objective. You know, in the same yeah. way that like. A cylinder viewed, let's see, edge on looks like yeah. a circle, viewed side on looks yeah. like a rectangle, and we might both, let's see, if I put my head wherever yeah. it would be, like we might both disagree on that, it would still be a cylinder. We wouldn't see it very well. Yeah. Um, and so, and we have this problem with just optical illusions, but we don't claim that the physical world is illusion just because we go, oh, our eyes, like. Yeah, it's but, but, buggy, the, but the like, mathematical descriptions depend on there being a conscious being able to notice them. Math doesn't depend on there being a conscious being able to notice no, them. If we were all died tomorrow, triangles would still be triangles. Yeah, but, but the, mm -hmm. the, the analysis of it, the, the, the recognition Only of the, the analysis, analysis of it. right? Only yeah. the analysis. The mathematics are there already. Like, that's like saying that an island that no one has visited doesn't exist until we look at it. It's only the observation that depends on us. The island is still there either way. We don't have well, knowledge of it. We yeah. can't make actions depending on it. No one can act based on the Riemann's hypothesis right now because we okay, don't know well, can, can, can I then move on from mm -hmm. that to the, the, the analogy that mm -hmm. That I was going to bring it to, mm -hmm, sure. which is that, that in terms of objective morality, mm -hmm. um, I don't see any problem, as, as mm -hmm. an atheist, I don't see any problem with the concept of uh, 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 objective morality existing in the context mm -hmm. that there being objective truths about morality and something mm -hmm. is either going to have a good or a bad um, mm -hmm. consequence of behaviour. That, 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 that I, I don't have any problem with mm -hmm. that being described as objective. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I would think is that any analysis of that is subjective, and that the the descriptions of morality that people describe as being objective morality mm -hmm. are, are are subjective analysis. Even if an an, an objective morality exists, what would your, your thoughts on that be? Also, I think our descriptions of it are imperfect um, in the same way that my visual perception is of objectively existing things and is yeah. imperfect. Um, but like my visual perception, it's correlated with truth. Um, yeah. So I'm not getting noise, I'm getting signal that I'm bad at distinguishing. Um, you know, when it comes to visual things, um, I was tricked walking down the street by some people who were dressed as statues and I thought they were statues at first. Like, and I did not then pluck out my eyes and go, eyes, you are so distrustworthy, yeah. right? Uh, when it comes to ethical things, sometimes something seems like a really good, like, actual good idea because I'm tired or I'm grumpy or it's easy. Um, and, I, and I'm wrong, you know, yeah. and I come to it later, or even I think about it more later and I realize I was wrong and I don't, like, pluck out my conscience if I could find it and go, like, conscience, you have led me astray, you're more signal than noise. I think of it that, you know, we have an objective thing and then we have imperfect perception of it. It's almost like tuning in on a kind of crappy TV yeah. set, right? I, I still notice I'm getting signal, but I'm, you know, a little bad at distinguishing okay. signal from so, noise. So if, you based on that, if, 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 if we're basing morality then, mm -hmm. if we're basing our interpretation of morality, and actually also I would say reality, but let's mm -hmm. focus on the one at a time. If we're basing our morality on, on those imperfect mm -hmm. observations and our imperfect interpretations mm -hmm. of, of observations, um, should we be particularly cautious in terms of what we're prepared to believe about reality and morality? Well, 
think you should be pretty like cautious of what you're prepared to believe because you're going to believe a whole set of moral things yeah. whichever you pick, right? Yeah. If you're just picking from a lot of different columns, you're going to be quite committed to any of them. You should be maybe a little lightly attached to your beliefs so that you're open to new data, which everyone should be in all... Yeah. Um, or, or, or let's, let's say even if we're absolutely convinced that something is is, is morally good mm -hmm. based on our imperfect mm -hmm. um, observations. Mm -hmm. um, like caring but, for but, children. But, but, we, but well, let's see. Well, well, let's well, pick let, something we're actually absolutely convinced of, yeah? Well, or, well, well let, let's pick something that... Let's pick, uh, let's pick something that talks in terms of the Catholic Church just for, for the sake of... Well, start, let's, start, let's start with something that is actually a consistent thing because the fact that you see things that people don't all agree with means you shouldn't probably be absolutely sure. Yeah. Pick, if you want... Like, okay, let's say gay marriage. Talk, let's mm -hmm. say gay marriage. That, that the, the, the Catholic Church teaches mm -hmm. that uh, gay people should be allowed to marry each other. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is that a reasonable position to take based on, on our imperfect observations of, of, of objective morality? Yes, yeah, so the Catholic Church position is based on what Catholic sacramental marriages are, which is supposed to be a procreative union of opposites. Yeah. It ends up being tautological, right? Because it says this is what marriage is and this is what falls in and out. Yeah, and but they, but they also argue against state-sanctioned gay marriage. Th that's not doctrine. That's partly something that states have to work out. The church advises that you don't do it because it's not what church marriage and it leads people farther away from that definition. Okay, well, well do you I think, think it's church, reasonable for the church to take that position? I think it's reasonable for the church to take that position. I also think it's reasonable for the church to take a position against no-fault divorce ever being legal and it's still reasonable for the state to legalize no-fault divorce um, even if it's ultimately bad for no-fault divorce to be an option. And, and you, would you believe that even if those things, based as they are on, on um, imperfect observations mm -hmm. of, of what you consider to be objective morality, uh, e even if they, they cause unnecessary um, suffering for innocent people? Well, I think the uh, bit where you're premising the question is unnecessary suffering, yeah. uh, where the contention is that it's not unnecessary uh, or that the other thing is worse. I mean, the actual practical thing that cashes out to in my life is that, you know, I think a lot of the arguments against gay marriage that I've read are very theologically based arguments. Yeah. And so like theologically based arguments for going to Mass every Sunday, they don't carry a lot of water for people who haven't invested in those theological ideas. Yeah. And so I wouldn't spend any more time convincing a gay friend not to get married than I would convincing them to go to Mass if they were already an atheist because that's not really the major source of our disagreement. The source okay. of our disagreement is like, do these theological positions carry weight at all? Uh, you would never start from, well, let's assume everything that I haven't actually proven and then just take the consequence and obey it. Uh, okay. There are people who make natural law arguments about gay marriage um, that I don't personally find as compelling, um, and I don't think someone who is outside the church a reasonable person who's honestly inquiring would be convinced by them. And I think that people should, like, the best thing you can do is, like, try as hard as you can to find the truth and then follow where it leads you. Okay. If, if the Catholic Church mm -hmm. decided mm -hmm. next year mm -hmm. that gay marriage is morally mm -hmm. acceptable, um, would it retrospectively have been right now? Um, well, it's kind of like when we decided that, you know, uh, Newton had described the world incorrectly, like, would it retrospectively? Yeah, like, Newton was always wrong when he described forces, right? Uh, the Church hasn't put this in the category of, you know, ultimate dogmas about the world, like, Jesus is the Son of God. Um, so it's something they could reverse, you know, you shouldn't put money on it down at the betters market, right? Um, but could, and it's not in the same category of, and it would shatter the Church to change it. Um, I wouldn't think it's very likely, you know, but it's not in, it's, you know, in the same way as physicists can, like, come up with an un best understanding. Uh, gay marriage is not one of the theorems at the top, it's one, sorry, it's not one of the axioms at the top, it's one of the theorems we worked out. Um, okay. And people who are theologians are fairly confident they've worked it out correctly. And just like mathematicians, like, after, it's a newer question, so after a newer question comes up, people spend a while going, well, let's check the proof, shall we? Did you think it was wrong before you became a Catholic? No. Okay. I mean, so I also think that secular marriage is the process of two people uniting to form a family with no reference to anything else beyond that. Um, and to be honest, like, so I don't like all parts of secular marriage, and I didn't before. Yeah. And I think secular marriage is, like, at the smallest definition, right? The act of forming a contract to receive certain benefits from the state with another person until such time as one of you changes your mind. And no one endorses that at all, you know, as an interesting thing, but it is the smallest possible definition. And there's yeah. nothing in that axi axi axiomatically that excludes, like, same-sex groups. 
Now, when you bring it up a bit further and go, you know, well, you know, it's about uh, raising children. You know, for me, that's not a problem. I, I'm more in, like the branch in which I like having marriage fights is on the can people dissolve the marriage or not. Um, well, do, do you think you have any role as as uh, an um, intellectual and outspoken person mm -hmm. who ha who is one of the sort of prominent mm -hmm. new Catholics, if you want to use that mm -hmm. phrase? Um, uh, do, do you have any role in trying to, to, to influence Catholic theology?